Good evening, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. We are online on commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, Twitter, and check out your YouTube channel. This program is part of our Good Lit se series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. I am Isabel Allende, novelist, human rights activist, a little crazy, and your moderator for today's program. I was given only a minute to introduce Elizabeth Lesser. That is absolutely impossible. Her achievements would take an hour talking really fast. And that wouldn't even begin to describe the person she is. She is one of the most compelling and wise human beings that I have ever met. And I have met the Dalai Lama, so go figure. <laughs> Elizabeth Lesser started as a midwife and a birth educator, and that is what she has been doing all her life, not with babies anymore, but with souls. She's the co-founder and driving force of the Omega Institute in upstate New York, a center of healing, science, creativity, and spirituality. Google it. It is a fascinating place almost as fascinating as she is. Elizabeth wrote two seminal books, bestsellers, The Seeker's Guide and Broken Open, two books that are always on my night table. Those beautifully written and profoundly human books caught Oprah Winfrey's interest, and she invited Elizabeth to collaborate with her on TV and radio, hugely successful programs. Maybe you should Google Oprah Winfrey too. <laughs> Now, Elizabeth Lesser has a new memoir called Marrow, A Love Story. When Elizabeth learned that she was the perfect match for a marrow transplant for her sister Maggie, she asked the fundamental questions. What it really is love, honesty, generosity, authenticity? This is a conversation. So we are going to talk for a little bit, and then we will turn it to the audience, and you can ask your questions. Well, welcome, my wonderful, wonderful friend to the Commonwealth Club. It is a joy to be here with you. Every time that we meet, it is a joy. And we are both looking so smashing, both in black and white. <laughs> my first question is, of course, how do you remain so youthful with <laughs> thin thighs and no flap in your arms? But I'm not supposed to ask that kind of question. I'm supposed to be profound. So let me try. Let me try. As a midwife of babies and a midwife of the soul, you know that often the most painful experiences deliver the best things. Tell us about this particular experience with your sister and what did it deliver for both of you? Mm. Well, thank you for that introduction. That yeah, was beautiful. Me. You have to thank me. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, welcome, everyone. It's really good to see everyone. Um, when you uh, train to be a midwife, you first of all learn the anatomy of the female body. And it's fascinating. The cervix at the base of the uterus is like this. It's this tiny little clenched um, muscle. And when you go into labor, it has to stretch to this big. And that's what contractions are. And it really hurts, right? It's very, very painful. Um, and what I learned as a midwife, I was very young when I started being a midwife. I hadn't even had my own kids yet, which probably wasn't the best idea, but that's, that's the way I started, um, is that if you fight against the pain of a contraction, um, physiologically, you send hormones to the uterus and the cervix that keeps it clenched. Like the more you fight pain, the more you don't open. And so what I learned most of all when I was a midwife, the biggest lesson was to stay open to pain. That pain is um, a message telling you that new life wants to be born. Whenever new life is born, needs to be born, it's painful. And if you shut down to pain, 
then you shut down to the promise of new life. That's the lesson I took with me from midwifing babies and what, you know, you say I'm a midwife of the soul. I didn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it that. I didn't plan to do that, but in a way that is what I do. And so um, I have trained myself to stay open when difficult things come my way because they always come, you know. You think, I got through that thing, and now I'm free and clear until the next thing comes. So when my sister was diagnosed with lymphoma for a second time, and we found out that um, the only thing that could save her would be a bone marrow transplant. And I come from a family of four girls, and siblings uh, give the best chance for a bone marrow match, uh, a tissue match. And um, when it turned out that was, it was me, who matched, all the other sisters in the family were like, really, you? Like my <laughs> sister and I were so very different um, that it seemed unlikely that we would be the ones who, whose bone marrow matched. And we, weren't, we didn't only match, we were what's called a perfect match. All 10 markers lined up in, to, to match. And um, so your question was, what did I what, learn? What did it deliver, this mm -hmm. birth? Mm -hmm. It delivered several things. The biggest and best thing it delivered was that it gave my sister another year of life, a year that she called the best year of her life, which was kind of shocking because it was a very difficult, painful year. But in the pain of that year, she learned the great lesson of her life before she died. Um, and well, from... What was that lesson, do you know? Yes, I know. Um, it was, although my sister was um, an extremely accomplished woman, a nurse practitioner in a rural Vermont town, a artist, a celebrated artist, a mother, a maple syrup producer, a farmer, she was like a Renaissance woman. Um, she had very little faith in who she was. She didn't trust her voice. She gave way more than she to others than she took herself. She allowed people to take advantage of her. And it really was through the year of our living more honestly together, and I imagine you'll ask me some about that, um, that she came into her own voice and she died way more herself than she ever had been for most of her life. Well, I have read the manuscript several times and underlined it because it's been a very important book for me for many reasons, many personal reasons. But most of the audience have not had a chance to read it yet. They will, though, you will buy it. <laughs> so um, please explain to the audience what, what were the physical and spiritual aspects of being a donor and a receiver of life? Well, I'm the kind of person that, like, when really bad medical things happen, I, I just, like, research the heck out of it. I know some people go into denial, and that actually may be a better strategy, um, but I don't do that. I become like Dr. Internet. So I learned everything about the um, science of bone marrow transplant, the science of blood and stem cells. And as I was researching, and I won't bore you with it all, because really I, I, I love the science of it, one thing that I found out that was so fascinating to me was that if Maggie, my sister Maggie, survived the chemotherapy and um, uh, all the other treatments she needed to do in order to be readied for a transplant, if she survived that, and many people don't, even after the transplant, there was uh, two things that could kill her. One was my cells might get into her body and look around and say, hey, this isn't home, this is other. We're, we're going to go on the attack. So attack was a, was a very common thing that could kill a bone marrow recipient. Um, and the other thing is that her cells could receive my cells and say, wait, these are alien invaders, and they could reject. And these two words, attack and reject, came up throughout the literature. 
And when I read them, I thought, attack and reject. It sounded very familiar as a sibling. Um, that's kind of what you do as a sibling. From the minute you, this little alien invader comes into the family, you like, like uh, size them up, and sure, there's a lot of love, and there was, there was and is a lot of love in my sibling society. Fierce sibling love, but also many situations in our life of attack and rejection, from small ones like, why didn't you sit next to me on the school bus when we were in grade school, to big ones, like when I got divorced, my sister Maggie um, rejected me for many years, and I never knew why. And we never really bothered to clear stuff in our relationship the way so many siblings are. You know, it's like you just sort of create mythologies about people in a family, yeah. and you just keep going on and on, and you never stop to interrupt the story. Why did you do that? What did you really mean? And so by the time we got to this chapter of our life together, we loved each other, but there were a lot of unexplored incidents of rejection and attack. And I had the idea, and you know, my work in the world is what Maggie always lovingly sort of called woo-woo voodoo, because, <laughs> you know, my years in the mind-body community um, meditation, yoga, the intersection of spirituality and science, the things that over the 40 years of Omega we've explored. Um, she was a, a, a farmer, a Vermont, back to the land yeah. kind of person. She had a bemused, slightly respectful, but mostly kind of like, yeah, that's my strange sister. So when I wanted to do something, what I called the soul marrow transplant, I wanted us to prepare our bodies through cleaning up our relationship. Like I wanted my cells and her cells to get along and not to reject an attack. And I thought, well, maybe if we cleaned up and explained and forgave and loved and created a field of love, perhaps that would help the transplant work. Did you go to therapy? We did. We went to therapy several times, but mostly we took what happened in therapy and used it as we spent more and more time together. And by the end of this, we were practically living together. I practically moved in and took mm -hmm. care of her. And um, yeah, we did go to therapy, much to my surprise when I said it to her, let's do this. She was very into it. She really wanted to do it. Um, you talk about how this experience deepened intimacy with your sister. You talk about the connection from center to center, from soul to soul. And uh, I wonder if we can do this with most important people around us without the threat of death. Could I connect, for example, to Lori, my daughter-in-law who's sitting there, in the way that you connected to your sister if we are not dying? Mm. Well, my sister, um, when she was dying, asked me to promise her that what we learned wouldn't be wasted on just the two of us. That mm. um, she mostly wanted me to help her children learn how to do it, who she was leaving behind. But we had a lot of talks about how, wow, why did we wait for this? Yeah. Because I actually, you know, therapy can be so long and hard and arduous, and am I really making progress? But the kind of therapy we did was very swift, and it probably was because there was so much at stake. But we went on a journey of going through our childhood year by year, explaining ourselves, and there were, most of it was kind of humorous and like, really, you meant that? And we moved through it quickly. But there were a few things when we really explained to each other why we had done what we had done, it was profound to see how we had made up stories about each other. You know, I, to woo her into this idea of therapy, I sent her a cutout, a, a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine because my parents always did that with us. My, 
I come from an atheist family, and my parents' Bible was the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> and they would always clip out jokes and send them to us, some sort of like wisdom material <laughs> locked in it. And I, I showed Maggie a joke from the New Yorker that said, two women talking to each other, and um, one woman says to the other, I've never forgiven him for that thing I made up in my head. <laughs> And that's what we do. We make things up about each other and then walk around with a lot of these storylines that can be broken so much easier than we think. So yes, I think we can do it with a lot of people without anyone dying, because guess what? We all are dying, so because we're alive. Yeah. Yeah. So And life goes so fast. and the most precious thing are our relationships with the people we love. So I have taken it on as a practice now to go a little deeper with people. I mean, I don't want to be that scary person that everybody parts at a, meet, at a <laughs> party because it's like, oh no, here she comes. But um, just, just, it is so much more possible and easy to have that kind of intimacy than we think, and it's such a loss that we don't. Allow me to quote something from your book, and this is what you wrote. There is my vigilant, rational self in my head, my wild, emotional self lodged in my heart, and a deeper self that some call the soul. Can you describe this ephemeral concept of the soul to people like me who are not religious? Mm. Well, I wouldn't consider myself religious either, but... Um, oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you are. I, I, I don't think so. Well, I love religion, but I, I, I do love religions, but I'm not, uh, I don't belong to any one of them. Um, the soul. You know, I, I love the word soul. It's like a delicious word. And I can't fully explain what it is to you. And that's the problem with religion. It tries to fundamentally explain the unexplainable. So I can tell you what it feels like to me when I'm in touch with my soul. And, um, and this gets to another aspect of the book, which is authenticity. I, I believe each, and I learned this when I was a midwife, when each of those babies would come in, and they were so radiant. And you know the, the line from Wordsworth, trailing clouds of glory. I mean, they brought into the room this light and this vibrancy. And babies didn't have a lot of the stuff us adults cart around, sort of an embarrassment at being ourself, embarrassed in our own skin, embarrassed of our bodies, of our histories, of our ethnicity, of our gender. We just all walk around like embarrassed. That's why nobody looks at each other in the eye. When you know, like the most terrifying thing is if you'd have to look someone in the eyes, you know, like walking in the street. So, and now with cell phones, we've all got a great excuse. So. But babies, the babies didn't come in like that. They came in with intact souls before parents and school and culture got a, got a hand on them and told them not to be who they were. So I do believe each of us comes in with this marvelous mashup of biology and culture and gender and we are here for a reason and a purpose and we come from somewhere, and we go somewhere, and it's an eternal journey. I happen to believe that, but, I, but you shouldn't put money on it. You know, it's like, it's, it's how I live. It's what I think and have always thought. And when you said, you know, engaging with each other soul to soul, um, kind of, it's so important not to just try to look for your own soul, but to look for it in each other. And to, when you look in the eyes of someone, you know, we're all, we all used to be babies. So to look for that pure light in each other. I find it all the time in my dog. 
all the time. I just look at her eyes and I know uh -huh. that there is a bigger soul than mine down there. It's much easier with pets than people. Yeah, much easier. Yeah. Not, not with birds, though. Parrots don't count. <laughs> yeah. There is a whole chapter of, of your book that I read several times about authenticity. Because for me, you are one of those rare creatures that are fully, completely authentic. Hmm. And uh, the, the, what we see is what we get. And all these years that I've known you, I know your profound sense of be, being true to yourself, which is so rare. Can you talk about that chapter, which is, I think, important for all of us? At yes. least for me, because I'm so And a so lot vain. of my authenticity, Isabel, I have, I have learned from you. Oh, uh, sure. No. I met Isabel. I'm not going to tell the whole story. I won't embarrass you, but... No, I tell the story, because it's a good story. Okay. <laughs> In the I Nazi place. I don't know if I can use some of the words, but I'll see what I can do. Um, for the radio, we were both <laughs> invited to speak at a conference in Austria, and uh, it was religious leaders from all over the world. Now, they invited you. They made a mistake. Okay. It was a clerical mistake. <laughs> we were the only two women, and it was held in a monastery in Melk, Austria, on the Danube, a huge, amazing building. And in the front row, maybe the front four rows, were all the uh, Catholic monks from the, the monastery. Abbots, the abbots. The and then there were monks. like imams, and the Dalai Lama was there, and the head imam from Egypt. And I don't know how we ended up there, but we, we hadn't met yet. And we were supposed to talk about what would you like your legacy to be? Your obituary. Write your obituary. No, no, it was your legacy. Well, it was the same, the same thing. <laughs> so what would you like your legacy to be? And I was like the good girl. I was like writing my speech about my legacy, even though I was like, I don't care. Like when I'm gone, whatever happens. But I wrote a speech about it. And Isabel was the first one to go before the Dalai Lama. And they said to her, you, yeah, the, the, so the, I was supposed to talk about this, and I had prepared a speech about something else. So I said, I'm sorry, I can't talk about le legacy, because it's a penis word. Women don't care about that. I mean, so only men build monuments to their posterity, and they want to control their wealth, and their money, and their name, and their family, and their dynasty from the tomb. That's crazy. No so, woman would think so like all, that. So all of the men in the audience gasped, <laughs> except for the Dalai Lama, who just laughed hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, yes, that to me is a level of authenticity, where, where you knew that you did not want to speak about that. And you didn't really care. You weren't going to behave in a certain way that this particular culture, a group of men, religious leaders in Austria, were expecting you to. So uh, that's, that's, that's uh, one part of being authentic, knowing who you are, and then being brave enough to live by it. Being the person I am, I can do anything. Being so short, I am excused. <laughs> people, people think that short people are also short in the head, so I get away yes. with a lot. Yeah, you know, my, my sister Maggie, who I write about in the book, was very, very short, and she became very tough. So yes, sometimes what looks like authenticity is a defense, um, but I don't think that's your case. Anyway, do you want me to keep talking about authenticity? You, you can. You have a few more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but there is something that I wanted to touch before we break for a minute, and then we will get the questions from the audience. And there is a sentence in your book that is extremely moving to me, and I marked it in red, and I will probably plagiarize it many times. And you said, death is not the absence of life but instead it is something shimmering and oceanic and tidal, bigger and stronger than anything we can imagine, anything we can name. And this touched me so profoundly because this is exactly what I felt when my daughter was dying. I didn't see it like the end of, 
of her life, I saw her moving into something else and something that was so big. And I, I wanted to go with her to see what that wonderful thing was and, of course, couldn't. But the fact that it wasn't an ending has been so important all these years after her death because I don't feel that she's, she ended. Mm -hmm. She just moved to something mm -hmm. bigger. Mm -hmm. So I want you to talk about that. Yeah. It's so, such a shame. I know there are some people in the audience, because I know some of you who work in hospice. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a blessed job. It's another form of midwifing, midwifing people onto the other side. And it's a shame that um, death has been removed from homes and made a medical event, because it's not a medical event. And um, the, the times that I've been with people dying have been so spiritually educational, way more than most of the gazillion workshops and retreats I've done. Um, it's it's, I highly recommend being with people when they die. I really do. Like if someone were to ask me, what's the best spiritual practice you've sat with so many different teachers and you've meditated and prayed and gone on pilgrimages? And I would say sitting with people when they die because they do go somewhere else and you do get to go a little way with them. And you come back changed. Um, so, yeah, I stand by those words that death is not the absence of something. Um, it's something bigger. It's a mystery. And to go part way with someone on the death journey is, is, is a beautiful thing. Uh, I have to interrupt for a minute for an announcement for the radio. This is the Commonwealth Club of California program, and we are talking to Elizabeth Lesser, co-founder of the Omega Institute, and author of a new book, a memoir, called Marrow, A Love Story. I am Isabel Allende, your moderator. You can listen to Commonwealth Club programs on the radio or podcast, watch our YouTube channel, check out our website, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And I think that now it's time for questions. If you have questions, please, Give them to me, and we will read them. While we get the, the questions, do you pray? Yes, I do pray. To, to who, whom? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do it? Well, um, one of my favorite teachers is uh, the uh, Benedictine monk brother David Stendelrast. And he says, to pray is to be a wide open eye in the dark. To me, prayer isn't asking for something. It's staying open to information. It's saying, I don't know what's going on. I'm scared. Remove the veils from my eyes so I might see what's really going on here. You know, the human brain and our senses are, are very uh, crude measuring rods for the universe, the, the divining rods. Like, our brain is, is a pretty crude instrument, and so is our hearing and our seeing. I mean, your dog hears more than we hear. Yeah. And well, my I, dog is special. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the reverence we have for our minds, I feel, is misplaced. They're full of agitation, and, are, and misinformation and fogginess, and there is another way to perceive reality than thinking. So when I pray, I try to get thinking out of the way and be a wide open antenna for a different kind of information and direction and peace and a sense of purpose and grandeur and awe. Uh, Albert Einstein said, prayer is sacred awe. Mm. And that's what I consider prayer to be. Remove the veils. I don't know who I'm asking that to. Um, so that I might see the sacred awe. So here are our questions. I loved your book. 
I read it in a day. I could not put it down. I'm so sorry about Maggie, but have you had, had any signs from her since she passed? Uh, yeah, I've had, we called Maggie the hummingbird because she never stayed anywhere very long. She did a million things. She was beautiful and tiny and um, zipped around from thing to thing. And so uh, both my older sister and I have had so many visits from hummingbirds in the year and a half wow. since she died and dive bombing us. And who knows, it might have just been a really good year for hummingbirds, I don't know. But uh, I, I feel her all around me, the way you experienced when Paola died, um, the sense of her being somewhere else. And since I think she is, I, uh, I, I used to, in the, when she first died, kind of begged her to communicate with me. And then I had a very strong experience of her saying, could you leave me alone? I'd really like to get on with it. So um, I've kind of let her go, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Thanks Do for that question. Do we have more questions? Here's another one. How did your work with your sister affect your family dynamic? Did it change anything between you and your other siblings? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I come from this sister society, four girls. You can imagine what that's like. There was a lot of uh, dynamics, shall we say. And um, when anyone, when you go through a family situation like a parent dying or someone getting sick, everything comes up. I'm sure you've all had that experience where it just brings everything to the surface. And Maggie uh, being sick and me being the donor and Maggie and I getting so close to each other brought up a lot of stuff. My sisters were both relieved it wasn't them to have to have their bone marrow harvested and jealous at the same time. So it was kind of like unfair, like, oh God, I'm so glad it's not me. How come it's you? Um, and it allowed for us, in, in uh, my older sister and I, I feel Maggie's death, one of the biggest gifts was my sister, older sister and I absolutely healed our relationship and have the most steadfast love and healed relationship now. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed and grateful. My younger sister and I, we came more into truth, the truth of who we are. I can't say like, and then we were best friends and lived happily ever after, but we came into sort of much more truthfulness about what our relationship was, is, and can be. And you know, sometimes that's what you get from striving for more intimacy. You, you know, like, you're not going to, like, the heavens aren't going to open and, like, we are the world isn't going to, like, come over the loudspeaker or something. Like, you, you come into the truth of what a relationship can be, which is so much better than living in um, ignorance and unconsciousness. Um, here are two questions that probably you can answer together. Um, did you ask your, your sister, did you talk to her about the possibility that you might die as a donor? Well, I think the statistic of someone dying as a donor is extremely low. The, the scariest thing about being a donor is that the um, growth factor they give you to make your stem cells leave the bones, leave the marrow and push out through the bones and come into your bloodstream so that you can then be hooked up to this machine that for sometimes for as long as two days, in my case it was a day, um, that all your blood is taken out of your body. But is it a painful process? It, it is, but it's, not, it's nowhere as painful as what it used to be where they had to actually uh, go into your bones and scrape the marrow out. This is a new form of doing it, which is called apheresis. And it's not that painful. It's very uncomfortable and freaky and scary. Um, so, but no, I don't think anyone has died. The scary thing is that they don't know what the long-term effects of that 
growth factor is on people. So it, it, it was a sense, but you know, I never really thought about it too much. It happened very fast. It had to happen right away or she was going to die. So I didn't put too much. I was not going to say no. You would have to be a really crappy person to say no. Yeah. And I'm not a crappy person. <laughs> and I wanted to do it with all my heart. I never, ever hesitated for a minute. And I don't think most people would. Oh, I think most people would. <laughs> uh, he, th this, this also touches to the same thing. This person very generously asks, how do you g register to be a donor? Oh, And why is you. that important? Yes, thank you. There are several international bone marrow registry agencies. One is called Be The Match. Be The Match is a fantastic organization. You can, all you do is get a uh, swab on the inside of your mouth, and that goes into a registry. And people all over the world are looking for a match because only 25% of all siblings will match. And children and other relatives have just as small a chance as but anyone. But can you match someone who is not from the same family? Absolutely, you can. And people do all the time, and those are the people I think are amazing, who aren't doing it for someone they know. They're just doing it because they can do it. And anyone can do it. And it's happening all the time. And so check out bethematch.com. It's a wonderful I organization. I think that sometimes one registers for something like that because one has received something very big in life. Mm -hmm. And we want to give back. Right. Um, it, there are little ways of doing it and big ways of doing it. And this is probably one of the biggest. Mm -hmm. But it's like people who are willing to be, I don't know, to carry a baby for someone else or to do that kind of thing. It's because usually you, have, you are grateful, mm -hmm. very grateful. Yeah. You were the donor match for Maggie. Your other two sisters weren't. Did this affect your relationship with them? This is the, more or less the same question, but I think that my question tied to this would be when you write a memoir, and this has been my experience, um, you don't speak about or write about yourself only. It's a, a lot of people around you. And many people feel betrayed, and they feel that, that you are telling a story that is not yours to tell. Mm -hmm. Even when I have written fiction, I get people who don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. because they think that they are the <laughs> characters in the book. So do you censor yourself? Do you, how do you do it? Well, this is the big question of memoir. And people are always saying, I want to write a memoir. I have an amazing story, and we all have amazing stories. And certainly someone like myself and Isabel who write, uh, quest write memoirs about uh, big, deep things in our life, I'm the recipient of so many stories. Everyone has an amazing story worth writing, except be careful what you ask for, because writing a memoir is a harrowing experience. Because if you are true to the form, you want to write truthfully and honestly, because if you don't, the memoir just like loses all of its air. On the other hand, um, you have a family that you want to stay connected to. And um, sometimes you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually did not want to write another memoir. After I wrote Broken Open, which was very much of a tell all kind of memoir about myself and divorce and affairs and difficult things, and my children, one of my children is here another sort of child is here. And both of these guys were in Broken Open. And they survived. They survived. But I had to show, you know, when you write about people in your family, the, the um, publishing house needs you to show it to the people uh, that you're writing about because, you know, lawsuits have happened. And um, I actually ended up changing some of what I wrote for some of the people in the book who did not want to have the stories told in the way I was telling it, honestly. Uh, um, <laughs> but with Marrow, um, I didn't want to write another memoir because I really felt bad for my family members. And I started writing a novel. 
But, oh, so that was going to be a novel. Not that was, but it, not about Maggie. I just was writing a, a novel about authenticity. I decided to write a novel and, my, and to set a character in the most inauthentic realm I could so that maybe w I could play with how do you be true to yourself. That would have been such a terrible novel. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, I yeah, wrote, if you start a novel no, listen, preaching, it No, won't listen, work. this would have been a great novel because <laughs> it was about a woman politician oh, running worse. for office, trying to be true to herself. Oh, my God. <laughs> it would have been a bestseller. <laughs> anyway, mean? it didn't work. And um, <laughs> I spent two years working on a novel, and it was very difficult. <laughs> and then... Um, what happened is my sister got sick and I stopped writing anything. And um, yes, I ended up writing a memoir and she really wanted me to. And her words are in the book too. She started writing and I used some of her words in the book as well as mine. It, and she, she very much wanted me to do it. Here's someone saying that your books are absolutely beautiful. Uh, do you think there is a swell of resistance from opposing forces when people, individuals, to groups or communities grow in consciousness? Mm. Isn't it's, this is a very woo-woo question. No, it's I not. <laughs> it is not a woo-woo question at all. I'll, I'll translate for you. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> so the question was, when, some, when one person begins to grow, and change and maybe want more honesty and intimacy and soul-to-soul -soul connection. Oh, you mean in a, like the, the husband? The, the husband, exactly. Who never <laughs> rises to the, to the place where he should be, yeah. Um, sometimes the husband and sometimes, let's say, you're in a family that, that has a more, you know, tight, uptight way of being and you get to family gatherings and nobody wants to talk about anything, but you've been to Omega to a workshop and suddenly you're like into talking. Yes, I, I do think that um, when you decide to become more open and conscious, excuse the woo-woo word, it does make people uncomfortable. And I always say at the end of workshops or conferences that I might be leading at Omega, like, okay, before you go home, don't go home with an aggressive attitude like, I'm going to go change everybody now. My like, husband, I'm going to change him. Yeah, like that's not the way consciousness rising works. You work on yourself, you be the change, as, as um, Gandhi said, you be the change. And perhaps by your gentle example, other people will be, oh, I want what she's having, kind of thing. But you don't try to aggressively change people. It backfires, it doesn't work. Yeah, I think that, uh, except in very particular small groups of people who have been together for a long time, um, then it works. It works pretty well because we all share some, at least the desire to mm -hmm. communicate and to be together. But most of the time when I've tried to do that, for example, uh, in a party, it ruins <laughs> the party. Yes. Totally ruins the party. People want to drink and, and just talk nonsense. And then you go there and talk about profound things of the soul, and everybody's very OK, bored. but I do want to put one caveat in there, um, which is sometimes I think of us uh, adult humans as like, adolescence at a, at a dance and, and no one is brave enough to ask the other one to dance so everybody just kind of lurks at the side and nobody dances. And I actually think most people are dying for an invitation to be more real, to not be party patter all the time. I think most people will respond with great enthusiasm to, to a question of the soul, of, of what's really real for them in their life. I think people want to, and it takes courage to do that. And sometimes you're met with resistance, but I would say, I always, I like to say, err in the direction of connection. Like, make the mistake. The worst that can yeah. happen is people will think you're 
kind of, you know, aggressively getting into their space. But most of the time, I think people want to go a little deeper. Here's someone who says that, her, my, says, my relationship with my sister sounds so similar to the one you had. I always struggle with intimacy with her. Can you, can, is there a way to deepen my relationship while we are still alive? Yeah. I think, you know, I think that's probably the question a lot of people will take from the book. And some people will never want to do that with you. Um, I quote Maya Angelou in the book who said, be careful when a naked man offers you a shirt. It's an African proverb. Like, some people will act like they want to have more truth telling. But actually, it's not safe all the time to do this with people. So first, with your siblings or your mate or your colleague at work, you really have to like size it up. Is this, is this worth it? Is this going to go somewhere? And uh, I, would, I would say most of the time the answer is yes. But don't go in like with all guns blazing. Um, I would say to just invite um, your sister to just to say something like, we could, I feel we could have more. I, I, I think we could have like more fun together, more honesty, we could help each other. Life's hard and we come from the same family. We know stuff that no one else does. I just kind of feel there's something between us. Would you be interested in exploring this with me? And if the answer is like, what? <laughs> uh, looking at their cell phone or something. You know, you, 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 want, you don't want to push it. But I think most of the time, somebody, a sibling will say, yeah, tell me more. I want to know what you're talking about. Then you could give them my book. Or, um, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes um, you really do need help. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I know a great therapist, one session, maybe we could get started. Um, something like that. By the way, one of the questions was about what kind of therapy did you do with your sister? Uh -huh. Well, this was just an amazing man that my other sister knew um, in a little town in Vermont. And sometimes I think of therapists, good ones, they're like modern day shamans. You know, they're like shamans being the people who aren't afraid of the dark because they've gone there and then they come back up with wisdom. And this guy was definitely one of them. He was, he was just a character and not at all phased that these two sisters, one of whom was dying, uh, wanted to do this and wanted to do it quickly. We met for four hours the first time with him, three hours the second time, and that was it. That was the only time we wow. saw him. Um, and he was. Could I have his name? Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll give it to you later. <laughs> There's another question here. Sometimes the complexities of family relationships are so profound that authenticity is blocked. How do you deal with a family member that is? committed to authenticity, why the rest of the family might mm -hmm. not be. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I sort of answered that with the, the don't, uh, you, can't, you can't dance with everyone. And it's sad when you have to say, um, maybe this isn't going to work. But I really, I think we're misguided when we, I think that's a story we make up. I'm the only one in this family who wants to be authentic. I think that maybe it means you haven't learned their language or you haven't found the right way. Um, I, I would just say keep trying in small and meaningful, non-aggressive ways. Um, and I, I, I really have a lot of faith in most people that they do want more. Here's a question that maybe all of us have had this kind of experience. It says that a person died suddenly of a complication in surgery that was totally unexpected. And uh, it nearly broke him. And is there anything that we can do for someone who has this, that kind of pain, the anxiety, the, the, the anguish of something like that? It just happened in our family that one of our 
very, very best friends. Um, she died in her sleep, and uh, for just coincidence, we were practically the first ones to get there. And it was such an absolute shock. This was a month ago, and we are still in shock. We, we just, there was no way to prepare for something like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father died that way. Um, and um, in retrospect, having watched my mother suffer through a very hard death and then my sister Maggie suffer through a very hard death, I now feel, wow, what a fabulous way to go, you know, quickly for that person. But for those of us left behind, it's shocking. It's, it's a huge hole. And um, I am a big fan of grief. We don't know how to grieve in our culture. We have these silly, like you get one day off when your parent dies at work or something. And my least favorite word is closure. Like we're supposed to like achieve closure and clean it up. I, I'm a big fan of like being really proud of grieving and wearing it like a badge of how well you've loved. Yeah, in, in, in the United States we don't even say someone died. Yeah, they passed. They passed. Where did they pass? <laughs> and you know, and in the old country, and maybe in Chile still, I don't know, uh, women would wear black for a whole yes. year. And you'd know like, oh, part the ways that woman who's still in grief is coming and give her space and support. And we're supposed to get over these huge, shocking losses uh, very quickly. I think it would be really good if we could all be grief revolutionaries and demand that we take time off to wallow in our sorrow and to wear it like a badge of having been lovers and loved well and to return to, to these ancient traditions where you um, had... You honor you, death. You honor death. As you honor life. Yeah. You know, uh, when you walk in a cemetery in the United States, especially in California, it's a lawn mm -hmm. with some flowers here and there. That's it. I just came back from Russia, from Moscow. And then the cemetery has these huge, immense statues of the dead. So you have the patriarch of the family with a big statue, and then little, little other statues for the rest of the family. But, but there's this, this exaggerated sense of the loss mm -hmm. and of, of what that person's life was all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that question um, from the audience member was very profound because what it points to is I'm, I feel like embarrassed and there's something wrong with me that I'm still in shock. And there's nothing wrong with being shocked at the loss of someone who was important. It's, it's natural, it's good, it's real. Um, that the great... Uh, Victor Frankl said something like, you keep the gap open. You, you don't try to shut it. No cl you don't aim for closure. Keep the gap open so that you can keep that person in your life and that soul communication. Um, that's why your books are so beloved. Your characters keep the worlds open. They keep they, they, the communication isn't just with the living, it's with the dead, it's with nature. It's, it's keeping open to all different life forms. Here's a question about how death or the proximity of death changed Maggie and your experience as a midwife with, with that transformation. And I would like to just mention that um, when my daughter died, she was in my arms. I got in bed with her and held her when she died. And it was a very long night. And um, I had, as I said, the feeling that she was going somewhere and that something profoundly mysterious, silent, and somehow painful was happening. Mm. Um, months later, my granddaughter was born, and I was the first person to receive her and cut the umbilical cord. And the, the sense in the room, the silence, the, the effort, the transformation, the mystery was there identical. 
It was such a similar experience. I don't know if you experienced that. Truly, truly, um, I did feel. Now, when Maggie died in a very interesting way, she was the third person in the state of Vermont to use the legal death with dignity pills. It's just been legalized in California. And it was, it was shocking to be with someone who decided today at one o'clock I'm going to die. She had, she wouldn't have lived much longer anyway. She could barely breathe. Her lungs were filled with cancerous tumors. She could hardly breathe. And she didn't want to live like that anymore. She wanted to go out on her own terms. And um, so to, to that intentional experience, like today's the day, there was no mystery about it. But she, it took a very long time for her to die, and a friend of mine had said to me, don't rush it, don't be afraid that it's not going to happen. She's be completing her curriculum. That's so what took a, a long time from the moment from she took it? From the moment she took it, she, from the moment she took it, she fell into the most peaceful, the most peaceful sleep she had been in for months. Mm -hmm. And, but then it was eight hours before she actually died. And I got the feeling from what my friend who was a uh, hospice nurse had told me that, and you experienced Paula as painful, people, all of us are reliving what we went through in uh, maybe life. Maybe I shouldn't have said painful, effort. Effort. There was an effort. It, there's a great effort. It's an effort to complete this life, to review it, and to move on. I don't think the effort is moving on. I think the effort is making sense of what this was and tying things up. Letting go. And, and yeah, and letting go, of, especially if you have children and leaving them behind. How did she handle that, the children? With great sadness. Yes. Yes. How can you be true to yourself in these very confusing times, where we, there's so much noise in the world, yeah. so much noise. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm a big fan of meditation. And um, not a fancy kind of meditation that you need to like buy the best yoga pants or something like that. <laughs> like, it's very simple for me. I've studied it for almost 40 years, and it's still very simple. And I, I experience it as, as a physical practice. And it's the way I quiet the noise so that that deeper voice can be heard, especially in these days with so much begging for our attention, our cell phones and media and the intense speed of life. And um, for me, meditation is, you know, the iconography that you see in so many religions, the Buddha with his straight back and his soft belly, or the Virgin Mary with her, like, strong back, but that, especially in Latin American countries with the fire in her heart. Meditation to me is a very strong sense of your seat, a very strong backbone and at the same time, a very tender and soft heart. And that is what allows me to quiet the noise. You need strength to quiet the noise, to avoid and say no to things and to choose your own way. You need strength and courage. That's what the strong backbone of meditation teaches you. But at the same time, if you're strong, you become cut off. And the feminine aspect of meditation that appeals to me is a very soft, open, receptive heart, but with a strong back. So that's how I, as a daily practice, that's now sort of just become my way of being, which is a strong back and a very, very open front together. Well, we are, I'm afraid, reaching the end of our wonderful conversation with you. You are just great, Elizabeth. I always learn so much from you. So I remind you once more that this is the Commonwealth Club of California, and we are talking to Elizabeth Lesser, co-founder of the Omega Institute and author of a new book called Marrow, A Love Story. And we have like a couple of minutes. 
And I would like you to read something that, if I find it, that I selected from your book, this, because I think that summarizes a lot of what we've been talking about. Okay. The wise ones tell us not to get attached to each moment. We're instructed to hold on to the ladder rung with full attention but no attachment. Each step up the ladder, a brand new, clean moment, free of the past and unclouded by the future. Beginner's mind is what the Buddhists call it. That's how to meditate. Begin again with each breath, which is practice for living. But right now, that classic meditation instruction seemed too dry for real life with its sticky past and its undoubtedly messy future. Perhaps that spanking clean present moment is not what I have imagined it to be. Perhaps there's no such thing as a bunch of separate moments at all. Instead, there's just one unfinished, imperfect, ever-changing, super fascinating, interconnected tapestry of time and space where all things happen simultaneously, undivided forever. Suddenly, I want spiritual instructions that tell me I should look behind and ahead and all around at the whole confusing, scary, embarrassing canvas with great affection, even with attachment. That it's okay to wallow in nostalgia when I hear a song from my youth, or to plot the future with trepidation and hope. To enjoy what comes, to grieve what is lost, to laugh at my clumsy missteps and at the innocent hubris of my plans. To be a wide open eye in eternity a heart beating in wonder, an inquisitive mind with an ironic sense of humor. That is exactly how I would love to live. <laughs> <laughs> well, our thanks to you, Elizabeth Lesser, and for your wonderful wisdom and humor and charm. I am Isabel Allende, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>